Hey everyone and welcome back to Heritage University. Uh, as we continue through this course, uh, to this point we've gone through uh, several different um, several different lessons that have kind of talked about the theory of interpretation. We've talked about the role of the interpreter. We've talked about the assumptions and presuppositions that we bring to the text. We talk, we've, we've talked a lot about just the way that we read in general, uh, but we're going to kind of take a turn at this point in the course. We're going to be talking about um, some general rules of interpretation that we can apply to specific texts. And so uh, as we jump into this, we're going to be starting by making a distinction between prose in the Bible and poetry in the Bible. So these are, are, are two different forms of communication, and, and we really recognize this uh, very easily whenever we're reading something. Uh, if something is poetic, it has a certain form, a certain meter or rhyme uh, in some cases, uh, whereas prose is, is the normal form of discourse uh, that, that people use. It's not poetic. It doesn't have the, a special structure in most cases. Uh, and so today we're going to be diving into, and this lesson will be, general rules of interpretation for interpreting prose. Now, um, what is prose? I, I've briefly mentioned it already, but this is a, just a basic definition. Um, the ordinary form of spoken or written language without metrical structure as distinguished from poetry or verse. In other words, prose is just the common way that we speak and write. Um, and you may hear that word uh, in a, a kind of adjectival form that something is prosaic. Sometimes people will say that if they mean it, it's kind of boring or plain. But in this context, we aren't meaning boring. We just mean the normal form of writing. Um, prose is most often contrasted with poetry, uh, which of course poetry uses specialized rhythms, rhymes, structures, and styles. And this is true in, in all kinds of forms, whether it's something like Shakespeare that has a particular uh, rhythm and, and meter to it, um, or, it's, uh, or if it's uh, uh, maybe something like a, a form like a haiku or something that has a very standard structure that it follows. But basically you have two forms of communication in written writing, and this is generalized a little bit, but you've got prose on the one hand and you've got poetry on the other. And you might say, okay, well that's interesting, but, but what does that matter? Well, here's why it matters. Um, there are examples of biblical prose, and here are some of them. Um, the, the narrative materials in the Bible, uh, for instance, the book of Genesis, narrative material, or, or the Gospels, uh, they are written in biblical prose. Uh, that is, they're written in common speech. It's, it's not poetic language. There's not poetic structure to it. It's just written in the common language of the people. And of course, in that way, uh, it's very easy to understand. Uh, the epistles, the same way. They, the epistles follow uh, a, an epistolary form, uh, including, say, the uh, thanksgiving or the um, you know, initial address of blessing or the concluding thoughts or some different forms kind of in the middle. It's not that they, the epistles don't have their own genre or it's not that the gospels don't have their own genre or even Genesis has its own genre, but... Um, as we think about those materials, the way that they're written, not necessarily the genre and the rules of the genre, but the way that it's written is written in prose. And so uh, any non-poetic material could fall under the category of prose. Now here's the thing. It'd be so nice if it were that simple, right? If you really could just separate prose and poetry and there was always a clear red line between them. But here's the problem, is that sometimes it's not exactly clear. Uh, so for instance, Genesis chapter 1 is uh, written in, in what could be described as a high prose. That is, it doesn't follow the poetic rhythm. Um, and in the Old Testament, we're going to talk about this uh, in the future weeks, the, the, the distinctions of poetry. But just a, as a foretaste of that, in Old Testament poetry, Poetry, you have different forms of parallelism that are evident. Uh, that, that's not true in Genesis chapter 1, and yet the form of prose is so highly structured uh, that, it, that, it's, that it's an elevated form of prose. Uh, it has a rhythm to it, even if it doesn't have the kind of formal stylized parallelism that's true in other passages. So, uh, at times it's difficult to tell whether something is pro poetry or prose, and here's where it gets interesting, is that these authors are, aren't bound to any kind of fixed rules of how to write in any particular moment, and so at times they may uh, give you a, a narrative that's very linear, um, moving through time, but they may stop, and then they may give you a song, or they may give you a poem. So, for instance, when the Israelites cross the Red Sea, uh, there's this uh, song of Moses when they cross, or whenever the the uh, 
uh, Israelites defeat uh, the, the enemies of Israel. You have Deborah, uh, the, the prophetess and judge who leads Israel in a song uh, in, in the, the book of Judges chapter 5. And uh, so you, you have these poetic materials that are interspersed within narrative. And of course, this, can, this makes it very interesting to read. But as we think about uh, biblical prose, it's all over the place in Scripture. A about a third, these are general approximations, about a third of the Scriptures are, are poetic, about two-thirds is, uh, is prosaic. But there are a lot of materials that, that are written in this kind of normal language, and so we need to understand how do we read it? How do we approach it? How do we understand it? Now, you might say, well, that seems really complicated. No, here's what I want to, to say up front, and I love this quote from um, Introduction to Biblical Interpretations on page 293 there. The quote is this, intentional interpretation of the Bible requires that we raise, and notice this, the routine patterns of subconscious communication to the level of conscious analysis. Well, what are they saying there? They're basically saying, whenever we read something, so I've got my Bible right here. If I, I pick up, uh, if, if I pick it up and turn to the Gospel of Matthew, I can immediately enter into that and understand what's going on. It's intuitive. There's subconscious awareness uh, that I'm reading a story. I'm reading a story about Jesus, a true story, a, 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 a historical story. But as I think about that, if we want to become serious interpreters of the Bible, we need to think about the way that our subconscious understanding works. In other words, we take what we naturally and intuitively do, and we begin to analyze, are we doing it well? So that's why we raise the routine patterns, what we naturally do, of subconscious communication, how we naturally understand and communicate, to the level of conscious analysis. And we've already talked about this a, a little bit, but I want you to think about it like this. When you pick up a newspaper, you, you subconsciously and intuitively say, okay, I know that this is, is meant to be taken very literally. It, it, it's giving me information that, that, is, uh, that is accurate hopefully. Um, and, and as you read it, you have a way of reading a newspaper that you immediately enter into. You don't think about it. You don't analyze it. I'm reading a newspaper. Same thing if you read a comic book. Okay, when you read that comic book, you understand, okay, a, a, an alien entering into this world is not an uncommon thing in a comic book. If you read that newspaper article, you'd say, I don't think I should be reading this newspaper article. You read that in a comic book, it, you automatically understand that this is this is what happens. It's not out of the ordinary. You're not you know jumping up and down saying, "Oh no, aliens are invading," because it's a comic book. And here's the point: they're they're written in the same prosaic form. In other words, it's the same kind of common way of using language. But the different genres have different rules and distinctions. Here's the point: we do it subconsciously. And the same thing is true when we pick up our Bibles. If we're reading, uh, say, um, if we're reading, say, a parable, uh, and sometimes there are things that introduce us to that, but if we're reading a parable, we're not going to read that the same way as we're reading the historical narrative that maybe preceded the parable. We understand that the, the rules are a little bit different. And so how do we read prose? Well, we, we lift up to our conscious awareness uh, the, the way that we're reading, and we ask, are we reading it correctly? Are we reading it in such a way that the authors intended for us to understand it? In other words, uh, if, if we picked up a comic book and read it, um, and read it like it was totally normal and totally accurate as, as a literal source of information, um, we would be misreading that. We would be misconstruing it, and we would be misunderstanding it. That's possible to do, which is why we raise to our conscious analysis what we normally do to make sure we're doing it the very best we can. Um, and <clears throat> it, this is, by the way, what we do in all kinds of areas of life. For instance, athletes. Athletes know how to run. We all know how to run. But a coach will come alongside and say, hey, you know, I noticed the way that you're moving your arms isn't the best way to do it. Let me show you how to do it a little bit better. Or, hey, you need to be lifting your legs a little bit higher. Or when you run uh, up a hill, you need to do it a certain way or down a hill a certain way. And there are ways that we can improve our skills, even though we have an intuitive and subconscious way of doing it. Most of the time we do it well, but there's always ways that we can do it better. So how do we read prose? There are some principles that we're going to talk about. The first is this, literary context. And when we talk about context and biblical interpretation, context is, is absolutely crucial uh, in, in, in terms of being a, a faithful interpreter of the scriptures. Uh, 
So we've talked about this again before that some people will say, well, you can make the scriptures say whatever you want them to say. Well, that's true if you just cherry pick different verses. Um, and we're going to talk about where those verses came from and, and, and how they're a blessing and a curse at the same time. But you can cherry pick verses to say whatever you want to say. But the problem is, in doing that, you're ripping them out of their context, and therefore, uh, you are totally misconstruing what the original author wanted to use those for. Um, it's kind of like, uh, you know, if someone is giving a speech and someone kind of clips a tiny little soundbite, well, you can actually make a person sa say exactly the opposite of what they were saying if you just take a little part and, and uh, a little snippet uh, of, of uh, the overall speech in its context. And so, literary context is absolutely crucial um, in understanding the biblical text. And uh, we're going to talk about this. So uh, context, context, context. Here's the definition given, uh, again, in Introduction to Biblical Interpretation. Context is the whole of which some piece is a part. In terms of literature, context is the larger whole within which a specific text or passage is located. So uh, we've got this image of a puzzle piece, right? If, if you have a puzzle piece, the only way to truly understand how that pit piece fits into the larger picture is to put it in its proper place. Uh, you wouldn't take out one puzzle piece and, and just, just analyze that puzzle piece. You could, you could do that, and there might be some bright colors, there might be something interesting on that single piece, but the only way you're going to truly understand it is to put it in the context of each one of those other pieces. And Here's, here's what we need to remember. When we open our Bibles, um, we have a blessing of being able to figure out quickly where to go, um, what chapter, what verse we're reading, and that's a huge blessing. Uh, you, you may or may not know that the, uh, the verses and the chapters were not original to the Bible. Uh, those weren't something that the authors themselves wrote. They were added really um, only a period of uh, something like 500 years ago, or at, at, it's actually been longer than that. It was uh, kind of late Middle Ages when the, the verses and chapters were added. Um, and on the one hand, that's a blessing. Everyone open up in your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 20, and we all turn to Matthew chapter 20, okay? So it's, it's easy in terms of, of giving us uh, a, a way of handling the Scriptures well, but the deficit, the, the problem that we often face is we, we, we subconsciously have this kind of permission in our minds to divide up into tiny, tiny, tiny little pieces larger passages uh, that really help us to understand what's being said in a particular verse. In other words, you know, we kind of rip out Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and, and, and we apply that. We misapply it in, in wrong context. So, you know, someone is going to work out, and they're about to bench press, and they say, well, I'm about to, you know, get a new max, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, of course, that's not at all what the passage was talking about. If you rip the verse out, you can make it sound that way, but that would be a misuse of it. So, again, context is the whole of which some pieces are part, and so we are, we are called to look at the whole in order to understand how the individual pieces fit together, okay? And we're going to give an example of that in just a moment, but there are three principles <clears throat> for literary context that, that I want to discuss with you, and the first is this. A statement means what it means in context. And these are, again, taken from the same book. But a statement means what it means in context. In other words, exactly what we've been discussing, you can't rip out a verse and say, well, I know what this verse means without understanding how it fits together. Um, in other words, that what you say that verse means isn't its meaning at all. The only way you're going to find its meaning is as it relates to a larger whole. The, the meaning of a verse is tied inextricably to its meaning in context. Uh, that's principle number one. Second, a text without a context may be a pretext. In other words, Always be suspicious if someone is saying, well, here's a verse that says this, and, uh, and uh, you know, I'm trying to build a doctrine, or I'm trying to build, uh, uh, you know, uh, an argument based on this verse. Well, if they're not giving context, or if they're not careful in showing the context, or, or at least being aware of the context, they may be using it to prove, and here's the point, their own agenda, rather than seeking to elucidate the author's agenda. And our goal as biblical interpreters is always to say, what is the author trying to communicate, and how can we understand that, receive it, and apply it? It's not about proving our own agenda or putting our own thoughts onto the text. It's about drawing the author's thoughts out of the text. Again, that di distinction between eisegesis and exegesis.
Then the third principle is this, and I thought this was really helpful. The smaller the unit you study, the greater the chance of error in reading it in context. Um, in, in other words, if you take just one verse, if I were to open up to, you know, my Bible fell open to Isaiah 34, if I were to look at uh, verse 4 of Isaiah 34, all the stars in the sky will dissolve, the sky will roll up like a scroll, and its stars will all wither as leaves wither on the vine and foliage, uh, foliage on the fig tree. If I were to read that and just rip it out, well, I could make that say anything I wanted to say. Or if I just looked at that verse, I would totally misunderstand uh, the, the context that, that is... Uh, that is about God's judgment on the nations in, in Isaiah 34. And that's, a, that's an example where, hey, I might think that literally the, the sky will roll up like a scroll. Well, maybe that's what it's talking about ultimately, but maybe that's a, a vivid symbol of the judgment against the nations. I, here's the point. I'm not making an argument about what it is. I'm just saying you will misunderstand a scripture if you read the smallest unit. You have to understand, how does this fit within its chapter? How does it fit within uh, a, a unit, say, like, like uh, Genesis 1 through 11 or, or Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. All of these pieces are part of a larger whole, and it's kind of like this. As you're looking at an individual puzzle piece, it may make sense. There may be some colors again, but as you look at the larger picture, you begin to understand, oh, this is where this fits in the largest possible picture that the author is trying to paint. Like one piece in a thousand piece puzzle, it will only come into to full focus when you have a, a glimpse of the, the whole picture. So let's, let's give an example of this because this is so important. This is such a fundamental principle in biblical interpretation. Let's, let's talk a little bit about context. Here's, here's a famous passage, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. And a lot of times you'll hear preachers, and I'm guilty of this as well, you know, we'll, we'll whip this out, especially whenever we, we have something that's mysterious, something that we don't understand, uh, something going on in someone's life, where we'll quote Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, which says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Well, um, this is an incredible truth, right? And of course, we know that, it, that, that it's, it's absolutely true that, that God's comprehension, God's brilliance uh, is so far beyond our comprehension that we can't begin to understand His ways uh, even if we wanted to. Uh, and, and this is true. Like we, we, we need to remind ourselves that even if God were to explain certain things to us, we still wouldn't be able to understand and that makes sense. After all, we're made of dust. We're humans. We're finite. God is infinite. God has all knowledge. God is the creator of all things. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. So after all, sometimes we just throw our hands up and say, we're never going to understand. Well, is that the right interpretation of this verse? That's true. Everything that I just said is true. But let's look at it, let, let's look at it a little bit more in context. Here's what it says in Isaiah uh, chapter 55, verses 6 through 9. So read the, the first couple verses before that text with me. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Then he goes on and says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither my ways are your ways. The he as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. So, in context, this isn't talking about some kind of like, you know, God understands uh, it, advanced calculus and, and math that we haven't even thought of because his thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways higher than our ways. No, it's talking about something specific. In what ways are God's thoughts higher than our thoughts and in what ways are his ways higher than our ways? Well, as we look at verse 6 and 7, we see in, in forgiveness, in compassion, God says, let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. God will have compassion on him. He will abundantly pardon. Why? Because his thoughts aren't our thoughts. We as humans don't tend to forgive to the incredible degree that God does. We don't abundantly pardon. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his ways are higher than our ways. And particularly in this context, uh, it, it, it's speaking of the, the kind of spirit of Jonah that sometimes the Israelites would have, and sometimes we have too, to say, well, God, these people deserve your judgment. These people deserve for you to, to rain down fire on them. And so God is reminding them, wait a minute, 
my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. I want to abundantly pardon and have compassion. So let the wicked man return to the Lord while he may be found. There's this offer of forgiveness and grace. So it's, it's the sense that this lavish grace of God that he extends, this invitation for sinners to repent, is a way that is higher than ours as the heavens are above the earth. So in other words, it's not just general knowledge or it's not just general mystery. There's a particular context. Um, Let's look at it a little bit further. Um, Let's add verses 10 and 11. So this is the context after those verses. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and don't return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth uh, and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So th- this is a famous verse, right? That idea that the, the word of God will not return void. But again, in context, it's talking about this compassion of God, that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. He sends those out. He sends his word out to those wicked men and women in order to soften their hearts, in order to bring them to him. And as he sends that word out, it won't return to me empty. So go back to that example of Jonah. Jonah goes out and he preaches the word of God. And even though Jonah's heart isn't right, the word of God does not return void. It shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. In its context, that's speaking of God's desire for those wicked uh, wicked men and women, sinners like we all are, to be saved. The word of God goes out, it softens the heart, and it has its effect. And so all of those verses, we could could talk about the word of God not returning void. We could talk about uh, God's thoughts higher than our thoughts. We could talk about God's compassion. But when you weave those pieces together, you begin to see, oh, it's not just kind of a a general truth that I apply um, in every situation. Not saying that it's not true that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts in every situation. Of course they are, but in its context, that's not the fullness, and it's really not even the specificity of what the author was trying to communicate at the time. So whenever we rip a verse out of context, we are running the risk of, of misconstruing what the author intended for us to see. In other words, we, we miss the opportunity to see the fullest meaning of something whenever we don't read it in its context. Now, last word on context. There are different circles of context, different levels. And you see here, this graph again was taken from uh, from our textbook, or it's similar to one that they used. You have a particular verse or a group of verses, and you have that immediate context. Say, in in the example that we just had, you had two verses. The immediate context might be those six verses. We can go out even a little bit further and say the chapter uh, I, I, Isaiah 55, the entire chapter would be a, a larger ring of context. But then you can go even further. Um, Isaiah 55, as part of the, the final chapters of Isaiah, there's a, a particular section that they're a part of. And then you could go to the, the book that they're a part of. Then you could go to the same author. In Isaiah's case, Isaiah hasn't written anything else. But if you're dealing with, say, a Pauline epistle, you could look at a few verses. You could look at a chapter. You could look at a whole book, say the book of Philippians. Uh, But then you could look at uh, the entire Pauline corpus. How does Philippians relate to Colossians? How how does that relate to Romans and 1 Corinthians? So you, you have this circle of the same author, then beyond that, the same testament. How does, how does the Pauline writings, uh, how do the Pauline writings and how, relate to the uh, Johannine writings or relate to the Petrine, the writings of Peter? Um, and, and you can compare and you can, uh, you can see how do these theologies, how do these teachings uh, cohere? How do they relate to one another? And then in the largest context of all, you have what does the entire Bible say about this particular doctrine? And so the, as we think about context, It's always important, and here's kind of the basic principle, it's always important to keep the bigger picture in mind. It's always important to relate whatever we're reading to its its larger context, whether that's a a few verses relating it to the larger chapter, whether it's a chapter relating it to a larger section, or whether it's a larger section relating to an entire book, whether it's a book relating to other books by the same author, relating to the same testament, or relating to the entire Bible. There are always these levels of context. Now again, I want to encourage you here because you might think, oh, well, if I don't know the entire Bible, I'm never going to understand any single verse. No, that's not the point. The point isn't to have everything in your mind all at once. The point is to just say, okay, what I am reading 
connects to and is in many ways dependent upon other things uh, that I have to keep in mind. Uh, it's, it's not meant to be rocket science. It's not meant to be confusing. But here's the cool thing. The, as you grow as a student of the Word, the more you understand the context, the more you're going to be able to jump in, enter in, and immediately those things are going to be there. Immediately you're going to have an understanding of, okay, if I jump into, uh, if I jump into a, a, a gospel, I, I understand what Luke seems to be trying to do in his overall pattern, and that's going to help me as I read any individual chapter. You don't really have to think about it. It's kind of like the, the subconscious awareness that you have uh, uh, as you read basically anything. The, the more that you read it, the more that you understand it, uh, the better you're going to be at interpreting it. So just keep those circles of context in mind. And uh, next, as we think about issues of uh, literary context, we're going to talk for a moment about historical cultural background. And these are all of those background elements that are going on in the text, some, some of the fun things as we dive into the Bible and understand the history and the culture, things that, that uh, we need to understand in order to rightly uh, discern what is going on in the text in any given moment. Let me give you an example, all right, of historical cultural background, or let me give you an example of, of how that would be important in modern day. So putting yourself in their sandals. This is another way to think about it. Putting yourself in the sandals of the original audience. And of course, even that, uh, kind of tongue-in-cheek is a way to say, well, they didn't wear shoes, they wore sandals. So just remembering they lived in a different world. They have different customs, different cultures. But um, let, let's just draw out the importance of this, and let me do it by asking you a question. How would it change the way that you read a book? So you pick up a book, how would it change the way that you read it if you knew the date it was written was 1776? How would that change the way that you read it? Well, if you're living in the United States, it, you know, immediately 1776 jumps out. Well, that's the, the year of the Declaration of Independence. So you think Revolutionary War, you think uh, George Washington fighting, uh, you know, fighting uh, the British. You think of all of these things going on at that time. Immediately, just 1776 signals you in to a particular historical moment, all right? So how would that change the way if you read it, read it if you knew it was written in 1776, all right? Well, what about if you knew it was written in 1776 in Britain? If you're in America, most of the time you might assume an American perspective, but what if you knew it was written by someone in Britain? Well, all of a sudden now you might wonder, are they sympathetic to the British cause? Are, are they writing something that's meant to uh, disparage the American Revolution? Uh, it might change it depending on where it's written and when it's written. Uh, let's add another element. What if you knew it was written by a slave? Well. That might change how you think, too. Perhaps someone who's a slave in Britain might look at the American Revolution and say, this is an opportunity. Maybe they read the words, all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And maybe that slave has a fire in their bones saying, hey, this, is, this should be true for me. So perhaps it's a slave who's in Britain, but maybe they're sympathetic to the American cause. Okay, but let's add one more amount. What if they were a slave of the king? And, and of course, this is just totally hypothetical, okay? So um, I, there is no such uh, writing. I'm just making something up to draw these points out. But perhaps the, the slave of the king would be insulted that these Americans would write all of these things about how horrible King George is. We don't know. Or maybe that slave would be very sympathetic and say, hey, I, I could have given you a list of 10 more. The point is, we don't know, but as we approach a piece of literature, it's incumbent upon us as readers to understand when was it written? Where was it written? To whom was it written? But from what perspective was it written? And as we think about those things, um, we will become better interpreters. In fact, um, let's say that you, you picked up a piece of literature that was written in 1776 and you didn't know that. Well, that, that would be a handicap. It's not perhaps that you couldn't understand some of the things, but they wouldn't come into full relief and in a, into full focus unless you did have that background information. So here are some histor historical cultural background elements uh, that that are are helpful to understand, and in some cases even necessary to understand, to rightly interpret the Word of God. Historical events, again, 1776, um, and there are some specific historical events that are very important in biblical history. Um, for instance, the the fall of Jerusalem um, was something written before or after the fall of Jerusalem or during. Uh, if you don't know something about the fall of Jerusalem, 
um, in, in you're reading the book of Lamentations, you will misunderstand that book. It was it, it would be the equivalent of you know uh, something happening in in the White House and the Capitol and the Supreme Court building all being destroyed at the same time by a foreign power. That would be a monumental event in terms of our history. Well, the fall of Jerusalem was a monumental event uh, in the history of Israel. Um, uh, so, or uh, say the Exodus. The Exodus is a huge historical event. There's uh, you know, several hundred years that separate the Exodus from uh, the fall of Jerusalem. Um, but you have the Exodus, you have the, the monarchy being established, you have the period of the judges before that, you have the united monarchy, the divided monarchy. And listen, it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, when you think about the history of the United States, there's all kinds of details that, that you can fill in with, with various periods of history, but there are also kind of highlights. There are also some mountain peaks that will really help you. And this is, of course, why we're doing the study, to try and have those in our minds so that when we open the Word, we can immediately say, oh, this is a 1776 moment, or this is a Civil War moment, or this is, and so on. Historical events are very helpful, which is why what you know our study Bibles give us some background into what's going on. Customs. Uh, my favorite example of this is in the book of Ruth, right? Um, whenever Boaz goes to the city gate, there's a custom of, of giving the sandal of one person to another to ratify a business deal. Well, to us, that this seems really weird. In fact, in Ruth's day, it, it, it even, or when, the, when Ruth was written, it even says that at that time, this is what it was. So it was a custom that was even past tense whenever Ruth was written, but it was something that was common uh, at the time when Ruth actually happened. Uh, values um, and values of other th others at the time. We have to understand that that sometimes uh, what's going on in the Bible, uh, they're they're living in a culture of Malayu like um, that has different cultural values, um, and so we just have to be aware of that. Um, some things that would be repugnant to us, or some things that would seem very odd to us, would be very normal to them. Um, economic realities: is it a period of plenty, or is it is it not? Political circumstances: who's in power? Uh, I mean, to, to just state something obvious, the political environment of the Exodus is very different from the political environment of the Gospels. And uh, in one, you've got Egypt ruling, you've got the people of God enslaved in Egypt, and the other, you've got Rome ruling, and you've got the people of God, oh wait, they are different, but there's also some similarities, aren't they? Which is why, in, in that case, uh, it made a whole lot of sense in Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 3, uh, of Jesus uh, 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 fleeing this kind of occupation, uh, fleeing uh, the people who wanted to kill him, going to Egypt, and then coming back. And, and here's the point. You don't only have the, the political circumstances of the moment, but you've also got authors who are, of course, aware of those circumstances, using them um, in interesting parallels and in, in, in comparisons and contrasts um, in order to make their point. So political circumstances, who's in power? So, next is power structures. And this goes just beyond political circumstances, but just in, in sort of societal context. Um, Think again of, of the book of Ruth. Uh, Ruth was powerless. Not only was she widowed, but she had, she had no one who was truly a kinsman redeemer until God provided her one in Boaz. And so there's a power structure. Ruth was powerless. Boaz did have influence. But even Boaz had to work within the power structure of there being a kinsman redeemer who is closer, which of course goes back to that custom of, of uh, handing over the sandal in the book of Ruth. And finally, you have ethnic reality. Again, the book of Ruth is so uh, incredible in, 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 in many ways, but the ethnic reality was that Ruth wasn't just a, a, a woman who was widowed. She was Ruth the Moabite which meant that everyone would have looked at her um, as, as someone who is not part of the people of God. There would have been a healthy skepticism toward her, but over time she overcame that. Um, but if you don't understand the ethnic reality behind it, you're going to misunderstand the text. If you don't understand the power structure that she had to deal with, or the economic reality, being poor and widowed and, and without a protector, if you don't understand the historical events, uh, like, for instance, in Ruth, this was the time period of the judges where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. It was very unsafe for women like Ruth. If you don't understand their values and customs, you will not understand the, the story um, correctly. And that's true. Um, as we read through the Bible, we have to keep these things in mind, the historical cultural background that illuminates, uh, illuminates the text. All right. Finally, the, uh, last, we're just going to talk about a few questions to ask. ask. And uh, as we do this, the first is, what impact did this message, and this is important, have on its original audience? Not 
oh, how do I feel about this or how does this hit me? But put the ears on of the original audience to say, how would they have heard it? How would they have understood it? Uh, for instance, the parable of the Good Samaritan, you may have heard this. They would have looked at that and said, how, how could you even use a Samaritan as, as an example of anything good? We all know the Samaritans are worthless. We all know they're half-breeds. We all know they're, they're religiously compromised and have a false religion. To even mention a Samaritan would have been scandalous. But Luke, in his gospel, mentions Samaritans over and over again. And then in the sequel in the book of Acts, what do we have? We have people in Samaria coming to faith in Christ. There's, uh, there's incredible importance. How would it have struck its original audience? Then, next question, what do we know or not know about the background of this text? The reality is we don't always know when something was written. We don't always know the historical background. So we do the best that we can, but we have to recognize we have a limitation at times in interpreting these texts. Um, and just being honest about that and, and, and putting that out, that doesn't mean we, we aren't still obligated to do our diligence to seek to understand it, but we also have to just be aware. What do I know and not know? And how does that perhaps limit the level of confidence that we have in one interpretation or the other? And then finally, does my interpretation stick closely to the words of the text itself? And here's, here's kind of the warning factor for us. Sometimes you'll have people claim to have these, these kind of amazing, you know, historical background or these different, you know, uh, materials or, uh, you know, parallels of cultures of the time that will take a text and, and you'll hear it and, and it might seem very grand, it might seem very cool, but then you, you stop to think about it a little more and say, wait a minute, like, are you sticking to the text itself? Or are you imposing something on the text based on this, this historical background uh, to really make it so, say something that it doesn't really say? Um, it, these are the kinds of things that, that are kind of, oh, impressive or, or might feel like, oh, when you, you preach it, oh, here's some kind of amazing historical tidbit that, that really, you know, brings this text to life. Well, yes, maybe, but the, the, and there, there are those things that, that you have to know, as we talked about. But... At the end of the day, what we're trying to look at is say, all right, God didn't give us a full history of everything that happened in the Bible, but he did give us the text. And so in those cases where we don't know the background, we don't know uh, the history, or even when we do, we have to look at the text itself and say, what does the text say? What do the words mean? And that's going to help us as we go into the lesson next week. We're going to uh, give an entire lesson to how do we study words in the Bible? Um, if we believe that every jot and tittle of the Bible is inspired by God, then uh, it's, it's also necessary for us to seek to understand the words, the very words of Scripture, the very best that we can. And so stick close to the text. Do all of the homework. And again, as, as you continue to grow in this, it, it will become second nature. It's not going to be sort of this methodical kind of robot. It will be very fluid. And the more you learn, the easier it will be, as well as the more you learn, the, the more humility you'll have in knowing there's so much more to learn than any one person or any one generation of people could ever truly wrap their mind around. And yet our call is to rightly divide the word. So we seek to do our best. And uh, I look forward to jumping into the next lesson with you as we seek to do just that. God bless you.